In this video, I'm going to prime out some parts with Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black. Then I'm going to paint some parts with a shiny Mr. Color Aluminum. Next, I will paint some parts with a beautiful NATO Green. Following that, I'll do some subtle hairspray chipping. And then stick around for the second half for when I start building the transmission and air cooling units. Welcome and let's dive in. So I'm using the Mr. Surfacer Finishing Black 1500 here and I'm mixing that with the Mr. Color Leveling Thinner and um, I'm thinning it back quite a bit because I don't want any heavy buildup to obscure the details. What you talking about Willis? Yeah, you can see here it's on there pretty thin, but that's okay because I'm going to come back and give it a few coats. I want it to really bite into the plastic too, so that's why I'm using so much of the thinner.
That's another reason why I thinned out that Mr. Servicer primer so much is because I wanted to have a really smooth surface for when I came back in with this metallic color. I didn't want any kind of pebbly or dusty look to it, so that's why I thinned it out so much. So here I'm going to give the uh, metallic color a couple of coats of hairspray. You can see it off gassing there. I have to be careful after decanting it sometimes when I go to pour it into the spray gun cup because it'll actually like fly out of there with the stream because of the pressure of those bubbles. So once the hairspray has been allowed to dry up and settle down, I'll come in there with a Tamiya color. I always use Tamiya colors because they have the nicest chemical makeup when I thin them with water for the effect to actually be controllable to the best degree. I know other people use lacquer base paints and stuff like that but trust me if you use Tamiya paints and you thin it with water on top of your hairspray you'll get I think the most authentic looking effects I've seen other people use lacquer uh, thinner in their paints on top of the hairspray but it doesn't come off in the same way it, it I think what I've seen is that you get these sort of little circles that come off like little round spots as opposed to like a real kind of a chipping effect it's just basically what you're doing with the whole process is you've got your base color then you introduce another layer that will become reactivated with water and when it becomes reactivated with water, it becomes unstable. And so if you paint another kind of paint on top of that, what will happen is the paint that's sitting on that unstable inter layer will just come off. Now if you think about it, lacquer as a thinner is very hot. So it's bound to bite in, whether it's the hairspray layer or the layer underneath. It's gonna bite in a lot more than if you just use water as a thinner. And then you come back in with water on your brush to create this chipping effect. So 
So here I ran into a problem that occurs every now and again. Either I didn't let the hairspray dry long enough or I sprayed a too heavy of an initial coat of water-based Tamiya. And what that did is it caused it to craze uh, because basically what was underneath it was maybe too thick. And so the paint went on top of that and then that paint dried. And as it dried, it shrunk. That's why you get those little cracks. It's sort of like the same kind of idea when you do crackling for like peeling paint or whatever. So I think the key is just to not put too much of the hairspray on and don't do a really heavy initial coat. You don't really want to put a lot of paint on anyways when you're doing these hair spray chipping kind of thing because you want the water on the brush to be able to infiltrate underneath that paint, contact the hairspray, reactivate the hairspray, and then that's when you get your chipping effect. So don't go heavy on the paint. So you can see there, there's a nice little variation in the color of the green. I just wanted to have a little bit more interest, visual interest, because, you know, parts might come from another power pack that they had to replace parts. And so you're going to get a variation there. And now I'm starting to use water on an old brush, just trying to activate that hairspray layer. And I'm going about it fairly gently because I don't want a lot of chipping on this. I just want looking at reference photographs there is chipping but not a lot and this is a, a material that is different than like you know like a tank armor this is a, this is like your basic um, I think that would be aluminum and you know it's going to chip because it's more prone to chipping than say something like the surface of a Panzer IV armor plate or even like a Leopard 2 armor plate. I don't think you're gonna get that much chipping on those things, even though people do do it, and I do it too, but 
This is more, I'm trying to be very selective. And it looks like I've been fairly successful on this part of the uh, operation. You know, I'm just wanting to get a little flex here and there from when I'm looking at photographs of the real thing. That's about all you can get. I mean, I could go to town on it and strip it bare, but then it's not going to be so fun to look at, you know. It, it, it's So it's like subtlety is the key with what I'm trying to do here. And I just got to be careful because if I get too much water in on there, it's going to, you know, flake off too much. Yeah, you can see, uh, even though it's out of focus, unfortunately, I, I think that you can get the idea that I'm, I'm getting some nice little tiny flakes. This is like uh, some, you know, floor plating that is going on the top. So this one I'm going to go to town on a little bit more, you know, because it's, it's going to get foot traffic and it's going to have a lot more activity. So that's what you have to think about when you're doing this kind of a chipping effect is like, why are you doing it? It, you know, you have to understand the uh, pattern of human uh, traffic or activity around a certain area. Like I work in the film industry. I work as a scenic artist. And in my job, I have to do things like, you know, if you have an old apartment building or something and you're in the suite, you know, like maybe around the door frame, there's some chipping of paint because, you know, people are active there. But I'm not going to put it like where nobody's going to be active like I'm not going to put it at the top of the door sill because nobody ever really contacts up there so I'm going to put it around where the doorknob is and maybe if there's a lock there or something like that so that's the thing you have to consider when you're doing this effect you don't do it necessarily everywhere because if you do it everywhere it's not going to have any kind of a dramatic tastiness to when people look at it you know and you have to make it logical when you do this stuff, you have to think about it logically. Like, if there's going to be activity here, yeah, there's going to be wear and tear and dirt and grime and whatnot. But in some areas, maybe there's zero activity. So why would there be any chipping? Why would there be any grime and dirt and fingerprints and whatnot, right? So that's a tip I can just give to you. It's just try to be logical about how you go about chipping this stuff. I know I see like some people like they'll chip all like the whole area around a hatch or something like that. And it looks like chicken scratches or something. I don't know how to describe it, but it's just like, you know, it's everywhere around that, you know, circumference of the hatch. And it looks like, you know, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look authentic. So just try to be authentic in how you're logically going about doing this. You know, look at reference material if you if you can find it.
Right, well, we're going to leave the engine at that point and move on to working on the transmission now. So first of all, you know, I've got to take all the parts off the tree as we go along and clean them all up. And uh, I'm really liking the detail in this kit. It's a uh, very solid plastic and the details are really crisp. So at this point, I'm going to just let you watch the video. I hope the cleanup parts aren't too boring. I just wanted to share the whole process with those who may be interested in how this might go together rather than just the casual viewer. I'm hoping to like help people when they come to build this video by showing what I encountered on my journey here. Anyway, so enough of the corny blah 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 and let's move it on.
With these parts, you can actually paint them before you glue them together. Like these parts here, you could paint them aluminum separately before you glue them in. I put them together because I'm building this for my YouTube channel and I'm just kind of like building it so that I, you guys can see how it all goes together and then I'll come back and paint it later. But that's the thing about model building when you're working on stuff. You got to think about, can I paint this separately? Because in that way, if you paint it separately, you don't have to worry about taping things off. You don't have to worry about overspray. Painting things separately also allows you to have like a clean separation from one surface to another. And that gives it, you know, a real crispness and authenticity to how it might look in real life. Because things can get a little bit complicated if you put it all together. Like I never understood like back in the 90s when some people started building their tank models and putting every damn thing on it before you know painting it like to me that just doesn't make sense i mean each to their own but that's i would never build it like that and it kind of is a bit more frustrating in a way doing it the way i do it where i paint things separately and i keep them apart until the final assembly because you're just wanting to get things together so you can see how it looks but for me it's more important to have nice clear demarcation between parts you know and uh, just keep that in mind can I paint this before I glue it on there and what parts can I paint all together and it, it's you can get into a bit of a production line with it right but everything's kind of got to be together when you go to age it and weather it and you know make that effect
So I've got the major two parts of this transmission air cooling unit done. But I'm going to keep them separate for now. I'm not going to actually uh, glue them together because I want to have variation in the green colors that I'm going to paint them before I go about weathering them, you know. So that's why I'm kind of keeping them apart right now, just so I can paint them a variation on the green. I really wish I was able to uh, be more informative about what all these different parts of this engine and air conditioning and transmission parts are. But unfortunately, I don't have access to a repair manual or owner's manual of any sort. So I can only guess at what some of these things are. Otherwise, I would be telling you. So these two parts here are for the exhaust system. They uh, go together very well, but unfortunately they look too smooth to me. Like when I'm looking at references, the outer surface seems to have almost like a textile kind of surface to it. So I, I'm going to try and do something with like uh, maybe like you know that white tape you use for band-aids and stuff like that for bandages medical uh, white tape I think that's what I might try to use on this
So this kit comes with some 3D printed parts for the sling and they are very nice. They're, uh, you know, really nice to scale. They're not blobby and, you know, ugly like in the old days with injection molding stuff. They give you uh, some plastic evergreen rod, I guess, to replace the 3D printed rods that are in there. So that's what I ended up using. And they give the measurements. So I'm just using my uh, thing here to get an accurate measurement.
The photo etch that's included with this sling, it's got some really nice cotter pins. Uh, they go on very nicely. There's a couple uh, other little things. Uh, I don't know. I guess they're like sort of like some kind of like attachment point or something. They're like these sort of rectangular things with the rounded edge and then there's a hole in the middle but where you go to glue them on the resin part they could have made that indentation a little deeper like a lot deeper it's just barely there so just be aware of that like when you go to build this thing that it's going to be pretty finicky trying to get those parts on here's the uh, cotter pin going on it looks pretty uh, pretty good. I've, I've never really actually uh, seen that included in a kit before. You have to be really careful um, with the glue because that part that hangs down, it's it should be movable. So just be very careful, you know. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. If you'd like to help support the channel, become a patron. There is a link in the lower right corner of the channel's banner. In the meantime, and in between time, that's another edition of Jet Scale Models. <laughs>